All right, everybody. This is Ross. By the way, I'm I'm down here in the in the corner. <laughs> I'm indoors right now, and uh, what what you're looking at here is a video that I filmed earlier today. And the audio on this video wasn't really all that great. I've been having some some audio issues, but also um, the topic that I'm talking about in this video, I think, is just so important, and it's sort of new. At least my thoughts around this topic are very new, and it's really changing the way that I grow figs. It's um, it's incredibly important, and I think I'm going to believe it or not use the the knowledge I have today in this video. I'm going to teach you guys about, and I'm going to apply that forward going forward to all of my trees. Doesn't matter where you live. This is going to be really helpful for you. Um, and it's, it's kind of about a very common sense topic. It's about light and how to light, how does light relate to figs, right? Well, we know that figs need like your standard eight hours of light, right? They want full sun. Um, the more light, the better, right? Uh, well, it's a little bit more than that. I mean, it's, it is some common sense, but we're going to give you guys some serious applications and, and tell you what I'm doing in the future to all of my trees to really make sure that they're getting adequate light. Um, so what I've struggled with here in the past is something that I've talked about for years is, and I never really knew originally what it was called, but I thought it was a hormonal imbalance and that there's a difference between the what's on top of the tree. So all this top growth here that I'm pointing to, and then what's below in terms of the roots. And if you have it the wrong balance, you don't have the right hormones, that right hormonal balance. And it, it kind of messes with the tree. And I think that there are some varieties out there, like Smith is a really good example. Black Mission, I think, is another good example of trees that if you just if you prune them too hard, they're not going to respond very well. They're really not going to like that. And I thought, well, the reason why they're not liking that is because when you prune, and you prune heavily, we're talking about like a lot of growth, you're doing something to the tree, right? Anytime you ever prune, you're changing up the hormones in the plant. Um, additionally, depending on when you decide to prune, you're, I'm trying to give you guys a little bit of backstory here, so hold on for a second. But anytime you do any pruning, like let's say you do some winter pruning, the natural response of most fruit trees is to then grow the following season, is to put out a lot of growth. If you do some summer pruning, like we do with our pinching, that induces fruits, right? If you do the summer pruning on pears and apples and stone fruits, well, then they are more encouraged to set flower buds and also spurs. So... Um, you know, pruning has a lot of effects and I didn't, I always thought that because we're pruning and we are pruning every year quite heavily on the in-ground trees is what we're looking at. As you guys know that we, we space them very close. Like, you know, there's a tree here, there's a tree right there. There's a tree right there. They're all spaced two to three feet apart. Um, also we do the cut and cover method where I chop all these trees, even if they're 10 feet tall. I chop them all down to six to 12 inches every year. And then they, they re-sprout from the base and they grow and then they should put on some fruit. So I've sort of struggled with that. That was always my big fear with cutting them so hard all the way down to the base like that. Is that my biggest fear was like, all right, well, we prune them in the winter time. And I know that by pruning, we're going to change up the hormones. We're going to have some weird hormonal balance. We're also going to have our trees probably just grow and grow and grow because it's it's winter pruning. And that's usually what has happened historically for years. Many growers, even in like specifically though, in northern climates where people who have fig trees in the ground and they and the trees get killed by the cold and they, they die all the way to the soil and people will – always talk about how it's so difficult when a tree dies to the soil it's so difficult for it to fruit and that's just been something that i have sort of been like trying to find the solution to for a very very long time and it's such an obvious answer and people are going to be like oh well duh ross i knew that i know everything <laughs> i mean it's just it's going to happen but it's really all about the light I think, I don't know for sure, but 
Does anybody know anything for sure? I'll tell you that the light has a lot to do with it because I want to show you a passage real quick from Pons, okay? So we've got here a little bit of an excerpt from Pons' book. If you don't know who Pons is, he is the leading expert on figs in the world alive today. Arguably the most knowledgeable fig grower that's ever lived. So if you're going to trust anybody's opinion, it's got to be that guy. And he says here in his book, in the section about growing figs, and he, the section about light, he says, the element of light is of great importance to the life of the fig tree, obviously, right? It, since it determines the main phenomenon of, an, of its existence, such as photosynthesis, right? That's kind of obvious, right? It's common sense. Then he says, though, which I thought was, I mean, it's not stressed enough, I think. It's obvious, but it's not stressed enough, is that it is essential that the different parts of the fig tree, even the less exposed, receive abundant light. If the branches and the foliage of the crown, the crown is the canopy of the tree, right? So if the crown or the canopy is too thick with growth, the shortage of light inside the canopy will prevent the formation of fruit buds. And then he also talks about how too much light inside the canopy is also a bad thing. But that's pretty incredible, isn't it? Isn't that pretty powerful? I didn't necessarily know that for sure, but you can definitely make an argument. A lot of us probably have seen this in person ourselves is that if you look at some branches inside the canopy of our fig trees, they usually don't have fruit. Or if it's lower down on the canopy, it's a very low branch on the tree, they also usually don't have a lot of fruit or fruit at all. And it does depend on the age and how mature the tree is, right? But those two rules can really be applied uh, across the board, right? So knowing that and sort of then looking at my trees this year, I didn't really do a whole lot of thinning. And we talk about thinning every year. And it's such a technique that is so important to the productivity of figs that you really just don't understand. You really don't get it until it just clicks, right? And I'll tell you, because we, when we thin, we're actually thinning out the canopy. We're not having such a dense canopy. And therefore, I always thought it was because then when you thin, the, the branches will be thicker and therefore more vigorous and there'll be less of them to then be able to uh, have that right maturity level at a quicker date. And that's just not true. I've been saying that for years. It just it never really totally made sense in my mind. What you're really doing is that by thinning, you're actually allowing more light to enter into the canopy. And by getting that light, and obviously you need thicker branches, I think. You do you need you do need some sort of thickness, maybe. May, nah, I don't think that's true. I really don't think that's true. I think that's false. It has everything to do with the light. It has nothing to do with the branch thickness. You can have really thin branches. Although if you have a lot of thin branches, I'll say this is if you have a lot of really spindly, very thin branches, your tree's not gonna fruit. I mean, that's just a fact. And usually that's when you have a lot of those really spindly thin branches it's because you didn't thin it's because you don't have enough light um so the light is the answer it's not the thinning necessarily but thinning is going to then allow more light into that canopy to allow as pond says to allow the fruit buds to develop so i thought wow that's common sense right but Putting it that way, it just seems to really click in my mind. And here's what I'm getting at here, okay? I can show you some proof here because in this video that we we filmed earlier today, I'm comparing two different trees, okay? Is that you'll see that on my, um, on the left side of the video here, let's pause this thing. On the right side of the video here on this tree that we're looking at, this is a tree called White Marseille. And behind me is a tree called Barbalone. And if I fast forward a little bit or get me out of the way here, this is Barbalone. And Barbalone, if you don't know, or you don't even know what White Marseille is, 
Barbalone and White Marseille are very similar figs. Um, Barbalone is only the only real difference you'll ever really be able to see is that Barbalone has black skin. So it was sort of a mutation of White Marseille. The fig genetically changed, mutated, and now has black skin. But the interior is pretty much the same. It tastes pretty much the same. The tree grows pretty much the same. The leaf pattern is basically the same. Um, there's very little differences. Yet there are some differences if you grew them out for a number of years. I'm sure you would find them. But this is like the best comparison I have here in that you'll see that along these trees as I'm showing you guys this is that I, uh, I show you that there's an imaginary line pretty much along these trees. If you see my mouse where it's going, is that there's an ima imagine there's an imaginary line right here where my white Marseille is. Anything below this line, so in this section of the canopy, in this section of the tree, there's no fruit. And there was never even a chance for it to fruit in this section of the tree because it was so shaded. I had so many shoots from the base. So if we compare, as an example, these two trees, I had on my white Marseille, I had 15, I counted them today, 15 shoots from the base. It's widely, um, <clears throat> it's widely regarded among many fig growers that if you're gonna have a bush style tree, right? One that bushes out instead of a tr one single trunk, you want to have a limit of no more than five trunks from the base. And why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with the light. <clears throat> because if you look at the Barbalone tree right here, which is significantly, I mind you, significantly younger. It's like a year or two years younger. That's why it's a different size. You can see how small this one is. But if you draw the imaginary line on this tree, is that anything below this portion of the tree, about half of the tree will not have fruit on it. The upper half of the tree, above this imaginary line in this area, has fruit on it or has fruit buds on it. The white Marseille, only about 25% of the tree has fruit on it. So what's the difference between these two? They're not the exact same variety. I'll give you that. They don't have the exact same genetics. But one tree, okay, um, has less shoots from the base than the other. So the white Marseille has 15 shoots. The barb alone has nine. So if you have nine versus 15, obviously one of them is going to have a more dense canopy than the other. And what I've noticed is that as they reach a certain height, depending on how many branches there are right they start out if you look at a fig here guys any fig bush at the bottom where the soil is and you have all those trunks coming out of the base you've got a really narrow canopy right you've got a bunch of branches that really are narrow and then as the tree grows taller it sort of grows outwards it grows out in different directions so that it can reach that light. You can see the sunlight hitting some of these shoots at the top, and now they're getting that light. And therefore, because they're getting that light, there's that line as they have spread apart from each other, there's that line, that imaginary line that I was talking about of where they're now getting the fruits. So it's, it's kind of crazy, at least to me, is that I always thought maybe there was something else going on here, and really it's just been the light. And if I can really focus on thinning the number of shoots I have, really making sure that I keep these trees in check, um, I mean, that was sort of my plan from the beginning. I decided this year as a little bit of an experiment to let these trees go let them branch out and put out as much growth as possible to get them more established. But if I could really thin these out, instead of having 15, I could probably, would I would rather have like, let's say four. I'd rather have like no more than five, maybe even somewhere around three or four. If I can do that. And also 
what we're going to plan on doing is we talked about in this one is widening the the canopy i'm taking the branches down here at the bottom and i'm basically going to go around all of the trees and sort of bend some of the branches down to form them into sort of something like a japanese espalier right what is a japanese espalier well it's, it's like a cordon system um let me, let me just look this up for you guys and show you a photo of a Japanese espalier. Here we go. So this is sort of what a Japanese espalier looks like right here. Is that you have these cordons, these arms that come across. Here's a really good photo right here. And these arms, the trunk comes up, then they split out into two arms, and then from the arms are the spurs. And every year you go back to those spurs and every year they send out these new shoots. And this allows for better light penetration into the canopy as we are basically directing the growth exactly where we want. And we're having a limited amount of growth, a limited amount of shoots, as you can see here. They're very methodical. You can see all these different stakes here for this particular purpose of staking the uh, the branches to those to those stakes just tying them up so that's how we're gonna get better production here guys um, is that I'm gonna bend down these branches and really widen out the canopy and at the end I mean that's sort of why Japanese espaliers work at the end of this video we filmed this morning is that I actually have a tree here this is my Ronde de Bordeaux and this is a really good example of a tree that has naturally really spread out and really sprawled out along the ground and almost was growing at the base here. If you, if you got a view of the inside of the tree, it pretty much was growing along the ground. Like it really has, in terms of the angle that the branches are, it's really on a really low angle. It's probably like a 15 degree angle, some of these branches. So somehow naturally, or maybe this variety does this, I don't know, but it really has this nice habit or this tree has a nice habit of really spreading out the branches. And that's kind of what I want to do to all these trees is kind of make them like this. This tree here received no head start. It probably has more fruit on it than any of my other trees. Well, not all, not any of them, but um, most of them. I have one branch here that has 16 total leaves on it. And this branch is, is really coming out towards this one right here is coming out away from the rest of the plant and really into that sunlight. And therefore it has 16 total leaves. Four of the leaves at the bottom um, do not have fruit, whereas the top 12 leaves do. So that means 80% potentially, if I had thinned out the shoots, 80% of this tree would have fruit on it right now. But instead, it's not the case. And instead, we go back to these other trees. Well, Barbalone, 50% of the tree has, has fruit on it. White Marseille, 25% of the tree has fruit on it. I have other trees that have much less than that because of my lack of thinning this year. Um, and I also have trees, believe it or not, that are extremely young. Um, there's a tree, by the way, if I go back to the beginning, there's a little tree right here that's younger than the white Marseille, younger than the Barbalone. It's about 25% of the size of the white Marseille, yet this tree has more fruit on it than both of these two trees combined. How is that possible? Um, well, how are my younger trees outproducing my older trees? It's all in the light. It's all in the light. So I'm really happy to be able to have uh, shown you guys this little thing here and really got, I think, my thoughts laid out in the way that I really wanted to. Um, I'm also, by the way, guys, going to be doing this on my potted trees, although we grow them as a single stem tree and then they have scaffolds. We, we grow them as an open center. And because they are an open center and not a bush like this, it's a lot easier to have more light go into the canopy. Whereas if you got them a lot like a bush, they really become shaded very quickly. So 
if you got them in pots as a tree, it's not necessarily something you got to worry about too much. But when you're doing your pruning, when you're doing your training, you bet I'm going to be focusing on getting my scaffolds particularly really widespread, really getting the canopy starting from the scaffolds, really spreading them out. I'm going to do some limb bending. I'm probably going to do some bonsai techniques where you put some wires around the branches and bend them down a bit. Maybe you can even put some rocks on the scaffolds and weigh them down um, just to open up the light into the center of the tree. And that's going to also create a better and wider canopy. That's what we're trying to focus on basically is getting that wider canopy. So yeah, I mean, if some of you guys are going to be like, oh, this is common sense, but again, you know, you know everything and that's why you're making a YouTube channel, right? Um, anyway, so we will talk to you guys soon. <laughs> I hope that uh, <laughs> you guys enjoyed this one. Hit that subscribe button for me. Check out our blog, figboss.com. And if you enjoyed this kind of you know type of video that we do indoors like this, we got our podcast every Wednesday night. We do it like this uh, every week. So we'll see you guys soon, all right? Uh, take care.